a chaplet of devotions causes and societies to which the catholics may safely adhere one question that echoes today from the portico of St. Peter's to the pamphlet rack of St. Patrick's is, will the advocates of this so-called agiornamento denude the church of all of its special clubs and devotions? Father Tarsicius, writing in The Vagrant, doesn't think so. If these folk singing, altar swerving, de Latinizing, renegade altar boys think that they're going to gaily take a hatchet to all of our fine clubs, sodalities, and leagues, they're not counting on the steel of community resistance. I am confident that the pendulum is swinging back and our young people will soon realize that they still need a kind of spiritual rug-hooking party to keep them out of the parked cars and picket lines. As for private devotions, they are secure in the knobbly hands of old parishioners, who still faithfully clutch the holy card-stuffed prayer book and medallions rubbed smooth by contemplative fingers. Those who agree with Father Tarsicius will be glad to see this pinfold of approved devotions and clubs, which are like rocks we can cling to in the rising tide of indifferentism masquerading as reform. The St. Contraceptua Youthful Anti-Smut League this society is named for St. Contraceptua Brown of Fogarty, Iowa, who died in 1955 when a young man she knew lured her up to his apartment and then began reading to her from the works of Henry Miller. She broke out into a series of eventually fatal screaming fits, though before she died she managed to tear the book to bits and crawl into the corridor so that she might not die in a compromising situation. A young electronics addict next door was recording an opera at the time, so that today one may buy a record of the actual screams of the saint. The anti smut League's members have preserved into their young adulthood the chaste rules they learned from their grade school nuns. Consequently, the girls never wear patent leather shoes, since the shiny surfaces reflect what the wearer has on under her dress. The men bathe in purple-colored bath water and carry carved sticks, which they use to tuck their shirts into their pants. All have installed in their homes tickers, which give them up-to-date minutes reports on the legions of decency ratings. The League's moderator is Father Clodian Gumpert, author of such pamphlets as So You Think Chastity is a Joke? Keep Your Hands to Yourself, The Topless Bathing Suit and the Bottomless Pit, and After Marriage, All Systems Go to the Knights of the White Sepulchre. The members of this ancient order are often found in the vanguard of the Army of Truth, hewing mightily with the twin swords of Catholic action and community reaction. In fact, the Knights are often referred to as the Church's shock troops. Up until 1939, they liked to be called God's Panzer Division. In 1950, a contingent of these militant laymen encircled the Bozo Theater in Strunk, Nebraska, which was at the time playing Tumid Awakening, a sea film. For three days, these embattled soldiers, protected by a rampart of overturned cars and torn-up paving stones, held off the police and fire departments of Strunk, though they were persuaded in the end to leave the vigil to a cordon of nuns. Only last year, the knights finally subjugated a druggist in Lumbar Falls, Colorado, who had been selling the well-known smut magazines, Lust Panties, groin, and man's rape. 
After starvation tactics failed, the knight sent in ematic stuffed children who vomited copiously on the magazine racks, thereby symbolizing the effect such trash has on tiny, impressionable minds. The White Sepulchre of Armbruster, Pennsylvania, which gives the order its name, is a plaster cast of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, and every October it is the scene of weird and picturesque rites at the Society's annual convention. The knights first don their suits of genuine steel and armor and clank majestically down the town's main street, chanting Hadouka by Syed Na, which means this is surely the White Sepulchre. When the sepulchre is reached, it inevitably turns out to be filled with beer, which spurts from the apertures in the upturned helmets of the members who drink until, one by one, they topple with a jingly crash. No one ever gets hurt at these rallies, and the reports that the knights sometimes handcuff people to railroad tracks were probably started by the P.O.A.U. 3. The Devotion to the Vestical Verger Quite a large public cult has sprung up around Hamish Rencut, the now retired mystic who was from 1889 to 1925 the verger of St. Edwy's, King and Giant, in the English town of Sluicegate, Wires. Hamish never allowed the sanctuary light in St. Edwy's to go out, though he stopped using beeswax candles in 1903. He explains why in his autobiography. Exfoliations from the Blazing Tulip One day, as I was gathering a bouquet of bishop's buttons in my garden, I saw a bee violating a flower. I stood rooted to the spot with horror as the gross beast gorged its swinish gullet on the pristine pollen of the weakly screaming flower. Finally, his hoggish repast over, the bee staggered drunkenly away, humming unconcernedly as I sank into a swound. As I lay there, I heard, as it were, a voice crying, The bee is unclean! Use not his gummy secretions! From that day, I stopped using bees' wax candles. I tried bacon drippings and gelatin as a substitute for a while, though I now use candles made from earwax. Human earwax, that is. The Vestical Verger was also known for his ability to read the minds of parishioners. He often stood in the vestibule of St. Edwy's at the end of Sunday Mass and told people their sins and what they had for breakfast. But his clairvoyance mysteriously disappeared one day when an unrepentant sinner gave him a nasty crack behind the ears with the wangy handle of an umbrella. As a substitute, the verger took up rhabdomancy, or rod divination, and to this day one may see in the sacristy of St. Edwy's the iron kettles, flat irons, and broken bottles unearthed by his craft. Perhaps the most famous incident in his life occurred when an angel finished the verger's job of sweeping the church for him. The weary cleric had fallen asleep in the middle of his task, and when he awoke, still leaning on his broom, he found the floor swept and the dust miraculously turned to gold. The verger's account of this incident is found in one of his letters to Clotilda, the mad nun of Ouvridge. See Letters to Astigmatic Stigmatic, published by Gasogene Books. Today, Hamish Renkut lives in a remodeled Kentish Oast house and makes indulgence bags for children. Though he seldom receives visitors, the ex-verger still continues predictions at the rate of 50 a year. On the Feast of All Hallows, 1965, he predicted that President Johnson will turn out to be a brass automaton with clockworks inside, operated from the planet Blagog. Charles de Gaulle will turn out to be the angel Abdiel, whose ambition is to reverse the direction of Earth's spin. In 1980, Bishop Pike will be burned at the stake at the Rose Bowl by the order of Governor Wayne. A Jesuit Air Force will strafe and bomb world centers of atheism. 
the wax statue of Pius twelve in St. Patrick's Cathedral will be given the power to see and hear and will someday rule New York. Those wishing to know more about the Vestal Verger should see Puccini's opera Il Mostiario Segreto, The Turkish Bedstand, which is based on the Verger's early life. 